So we have with us our uh, very uh, now becoming a very experienced moderator, Jack mm-hmm. Bales, who uh, has uh, this is what your your third or my third one, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. your third one. Uh, this is his third uh, moderation. So, and he picked a very good book, by the way. Uh, I like to just say something about it and uh, this book and uh, about its author. Uh, it's it's but didn't we have fun? Uh, which is by Peter Morris. And this book was actually published in 2008. And that is uh, when Bob Bailey uh, was starting to cook up the idea of doing a, a conference in Cooperstown, <laughs> of all places. And that became, of course, our 2009, our next year was our Fred Conference. And the Fred Conference that year was actually moderated by Frederick Ivor Campbell. That was the last... Uh, uh, time we we actually had him engaged in you know doing something with the committee and uh, it was a great panel discussion and the panelists were John Thorne, hmm. Bill Rysak, mm-hmm. Peter Morris, and Gary Mitchum of um, yeah. McFarland McFarland, Press. Yeah. And the hitters. topic of that uh, panel discussion was going from research. To writing to publication. Wow. And had, uh, I guess, the best guns in the business on the yeah. panel because they were all very accomplished uh, researchers, writers, and published authors. And it was about how did they, what was the process to get there? And it was a great discussion and Fred moderated it in a great way. So uh, this book was very special because I remember reading it when I first got it. And that was right after it was published. And when I reread it, uh, it's just as exciting, if not more so, <laughs> because mm-hmm. than the first time around. So I want to turn everything over to Jack Bales. Okay. And uh, he'll be moderating uh, this discussion. Um, I think we're all, we can unmute or mute as the need be. Uh, you can jump in and ask questions, I believe. Mm-hmm. Is that you're comfortable with that, Jack? Absolutely. I was just going to say that, in fact. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, great. without further ado, I'll turn it Okay, great. To I was saying, uh, Peter said, this is my third one. I think I'm, I might finally get the knack of this now. But for what I did, I took a lot of, a lot of notes on this. And, 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 you know, Peter covers so much here. And then I kind of condensed it. And so for those of you who just want to kind of, as, as uh, uh, Paul was saying, just kind of sit down and listen, that's fine because I want to cover an off because Peter covered so much stuff here and I've got it all in my mind here. If I want to go over some of this and here and there, I want to ask for questions and comments, but feel free to jump in at any time. Okay, so that's that goes without saying. And, uh, now, I was recently reading a kid's book from the 1930s by a friend of mine gave it to me. He knew I liked baseball, but a guy named Elmer Dawson, it was, and the book was called The Pickup Nine, or they always have a subtitle, The Chester Boys on the Diamond. And in the very first chapter, the second page, the author writes, quote, but in spite of the handicap of having a very rough lot on which to play and practice, the Chester Boys and their friends managed to get a great deal of fun out of the game. Unquote. And that, of course, struck me when I started reading the book, because that's what Peter, or the whole idea of Peter's book. Uh, and, I, and I thought of selecting this book because in an earlier book discussion group, we were talking about uh, his book on catchers, which led to a discussion of his other works. And as, and as Peter and Bob both said, uh, Peter's very accomplished. His book, A Game of Inches, which I just marvel at every time I pick it up, won the Seymour Medal and the Casey Award for the best baseball book of the year. Okay, so Peter writes in the introduction of his book that a lot has been written on baseball's early years, but many of the narratives are dense and they're hard to figure out or they make for hard reading. So, But then he came across various accounts of baseball written by men who took part in the 19, or 1840s and the 50s and the 60s. And while they could not sta- stand alone, he set out to make a very cohesive uh, story a feature in all these and and that's what i think he, he exactly did i love, love all the end notes in the back that kind of uh uh support his cohesive story which i think is one of the hallmarks of his of his writing um 
Uh, Peter had examples to illustrate his points. Uh, he talked about the baseball grounds. I'm going to get to this and their drainage problems. And before an 1869 game in Washington, the field was so wet, he said that they had a, a, a steam fire engine to pump out the water on the field. He mentioned that the trees in the uh, tree in the least is it pronounced the Lysian fields? Is that how it's pronounced? Lysian uh, fields park interfere with play. Uh, and he mentioned a speech at a banquet at the Excelsior Club in Brooklyn in which the guy went on and on about the chicken pot pie, which kind of brought down the house. So I loved all his examples and, and his easy narrative style of writing Peter has. And as we all know, one can't really pinpoint the exact origin of baseball. And as Peter notes, there were a lot of bat and ball games uh, played in the U.S. in the 1840s uh, with the Knickerbocker Club of New York playing baseball in 1843. And he said that most clubs did not keep track of their activities, but the, but the Knickerbocker Club really did. And and as he, I can tell by reading Peter's book that he relied upon these Knickerbocker accounts uh, very carefully. And, he, and the Knickerbockers recorded practically everything they did, which was highly unusual at the time. Um, I thought it was interesting when, when Peter mentioned quite a few times that the rules were very fluid and that they varied from region uh, uh, to region and from city to city, and I guess even from um, to day to day. Okay. okay, now here's something curious about it. I wanted to ask you all about this, if you knew anything about it. And at first, Peter said that the clubs had no rules as the members, of course, played for fun and they didn't think that they were necessary. And, and Peter said that the rules were designed to clarify disputed points rather than to spell out the actual intricacies and the mechanics of how the game is played. For example, they created the position of shortstop because they needed the position of shortstop. Uh, and after a while, there was no soaking, which wasn't a term I was familiar with until I read this book about you know throwing the ball at the, uh, the batter to get him out. But... After a while, there was no soaking because the ball was a lively ball and it hurt uh, and everything. And Peter said, quote, the solution was to create the rules that would settle these specific points while otherwise leaving things as they were. And uh, does that do any of you know about back then some of the rules that were designed for these specific points? Do you know of any rules that... Like Peter said, they vary from locality to locality. And if so, you know, what locality? I'm, we're familiar with the Massachusetts rules and the Knickerbocker rules, but does anybody know of any, you know, really specific rules that varied? Because I, I did not know of any. Did anybody? Okay. I, I remember as a kid playing, if you didn't have a full nine there, you know, right-handers had to hit to one side of second base and left-handers had to hit oh, yeah. the other side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if they had those sort of things. I was, I, I, I was, I was born till 1880, so I, I don't recall. Right. right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, when I was a kid, um, the field I, uh, the neighborhood kids played on, there was a big pine tree, uh, in the middle of the left field, and if you hit the ball there, it was a ground rule double, for example. Oh yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, even in the major league era. You know, the, there, where you had a short fence, they would, even if you hit it over the fence, they would call it a double. What, what, it, what it brought to me was thinking about this, <clears throat> kind of like the last book we did with, you know, if I never get back, where you talk about a lot of the vintage baseball aspects of it. So, uh -huh. you know, when we play as vintage ballists, we go out and the first thing we do is captains meet with the umpire and you're like, okay, if it's hit here, it's this, if it's hits here, it's that, et cetera, et cetera. So you're talking about those specific rules for that location. But I think maybe he meant where it's like, okay, this is our set rules. This is our set guidelines. We're not going to call strikes. You know, this is a fair foul hit, whatever oh, yeah. it is. Okay. And then you've got all these other ground rules that come into play based on where you are. You know, as vintage balls, we play in a cemetery. So if you hit it over here, it goes here, such and such. So I, I wonder if that was more of the, they're starting to standardize those rules, which right. really didn't happen for another 10 years as we see almost every year four balls then there were five balls and there were four strikes and it just changed on and on so <clears throat> i think there was a presentation at the fred about three or four years ago um mm -hmm. that about uh the changing balls and strikes if you will 
That yeah. makes me wonder also about the fair foul rule when that came in. We know it was in existence in 76, went away in 77, but Seven, we don't, yeah. do we know whether it was in existence before that and for how long and when it was created? It, it, it was in existence through the whole whole National Association period. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that makes sense what you guys were saying, especially Paul about, you know, I didn't, I didn't read it that way and I probably, probably should have, but thanks for saying that and you other others too. Uh, Peter writes that the Knickerbockers were reluctant to embrace the whole competitiveness angle. Uh, and, and some clubs accepted members because of their skills, but the Knickerbockers appreciated the skills and they wanted to win and peter talks about how they really they wanted the win but they they wanted members who were gent who were gentlemen who just enjoyed the game uh and peter mentions that too often the baseball writers current baseball writers and historians talk about this formal competitive side but then neglect the fun side so i went back and looked at john thorne's book and john i know talks about the the fun side of things too which i figured he probably would have um now, most of my work on the, I did a lot, I've done a lot on the Chicago White Stockings, but most of my work started in the late 1860s, and that was beyond these fun years. But I did a little bit of digging around, and it was exactly like Peter said. I, I dug around in the, in the New York Times database, and on August 23rd, 1858, the New York Times talks about a game between the Excelsiors of Brooklyn, South Brooklyn, and the Knickerbockers, and they wrote, quote, one thing was very apparent throughout the match. It was the gentlemanly, they always use that word, gentlemanly and good humored courtesy, which was displayed by both parties to each other. In fact, it seemed anything else but a contest for the superiority between two powerful clubs. And afterwards, just like Peter says, they were escorted to a, to a big hall. Some 200 people provided a quote unquote scrumptious sumptuous excuse me sumptuous dinner the excelsiors won so they were presented with the game ball uh there were toasts there were cheers there were songs and a band escorted them to a ferry afterwards so they could go home um and this whole part of this whole gentlemanly thing this was all kind of fairly new to me because again my research for the white stockings didn't i didn't really go into anything much before 1867 68 and when, while reading the book, were any of you kind of surprised at this? Or did you know about it before? Or did, or did you ever come across accounts of clubs that played, played simply for fun and not for competition? Because before, before I looked this one quote up, you know, this one passage up, I did, I did not know of any of this. You know, so I, I was wondering what your experiences were with this type of club at this time. I think, again, it goes back to me with a couple of things for me for vintage baseball and for um some of my own research so with vintage baseball we always are it's a gentlemanly game and i could tell you that i'm a nice guy but there have been discussions on the field that haven't you're trying to keep your temper but you're also like you know you have that nice little conversation with the fielder was i out was i not out that sort of thing right. um but i think what was interesting about that what i picked out is that um, I've been looking through some of the scorebooks of the 1857 through 1860 Buffalo Niagara's. And the, he mentions in the book as well, you've got, you know, the Slims versus the Fats, or you've got these different folks. And you've also got what I'm seeing a lot of, and I think you have the first nine, the second nine. So you've got in one game, you've got, okay, these guys are on the Niagara's today. Tomorrow they're over here on this, this, this squad or what have you. So I think the gentlemanly is a couple of things to me. It's a, they're gentlemen because they're friends. I mean, they're all, they all know each other. They're all this band of baseballists, if you will. And then I think the other thing about that too, is that, you know, it is a gentlemanly, it's a, it's the error. It's the, the, the sophisticated gentleman, but I, they all know each other. They're, they're playing for the fun of it. They're playing for the, the bragging rights in a lot of ways. And they're mm -hmm. a lot of it. They're trying to one up each other, you know, with these, these chowder suppers and this person at that one. And, you know, oh, they, and, and I, what I thought was kind of cool for me, I'm sorry, I'm going on a little bit, but I read that account and then I thought of like, we play vintage baseball, then we go to the bar, then we get food, then we have drinks, then we joke around with the other team. And <laughs> it's just this whole camaraderie that just kind of starts and goes. Yeah. So, yeah, that's where I really, wow. I think okay. it's just that, that open that, you know, I don't know, everybody knows each other. We're all friends here. Yeah. And even on the opposing teams, I take it. Yeah. 
Okay. My impression <clears throat> is that there's a kind of a distinction between intra club games where you're choosing up sides. Uh, one week you're a teammate of this guy, the next week he's on the opposing team. Intra club games versus inter club games where you mm -hmm. don't really know often the guys on the other side. I think the gentleman thing is more likely to happen on the intra club oh, game. I that. see. So yeah. That was kind of my impression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I found it really interesting that there was such an emphasis on being gentlemanly. You only say that over and over again if there's a really serious chance of it not happening. Mm -hmm. um, these are not gentlemen. These are these are middle class men mostly. Um, these are these are working guys, um, and some of them are working class. Um, and I also found it interesting that in the U.S. of all places, um, there would be such an emphasis on gentlemanly because a gentleman is a noble and the one thing that the u.s's history is all about is not having any nobles so you have this kind of false gentlemanliness which is being enforced repeatedly so you don't behave in the way that you might normally behave well christopher that's a good point because you mentioned working class well peter says that a lot of the clubs again which i did not know of were based on occupation like firemen we had what a great dis where I had a great distinction in the in the community because they put out fires, but there was I had no idea there were the Etnas and the mutuals, but these were based on insurance companies, yeah. and they had clubs which were, you know, in honor. The names were in honor of insurance companies or in honor of fire companies, and the experts were based on a shipbuilding company uh, farm, and the the members were all shipbuilding people. So yeah, definitely working class. So yeah, well, there are people. I don't know. There are people of different classes here, right? Some of them are yeah. office workers, like insurance people, and some of them are right. shipbuilders. And and uh, uh, firemen were notorious for being roughhousers, you know, in those days, as were policemen. Um, so it's interesting that there's this emphasis. They keep repeating it over and over again. We're going to be gentlemanly. And uh, yeah. clearly there's an issue here. Yeah. <laughs> well, there were two words that were used in that context. Gentlemanly, I remember Chadwick writing about these things. Uh, gentlemanly, because he didn't want to see arguments and, and gambling and, and drinking and whatnot. But he also wanted to see a manly game. Yes. Uh, th that's the other word that was used. So that was skillful, I think, is what they were really getting at. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, on, on that point, I think the other word that comes up is scientific, too. Um, the the, the desire, I think, to make this game from a scientific point of view more and more comparable to how cricket was played, where you had a, uh, a, a you know, defined set of rules, a defined set of behaviors, um, but you also had a hard ball that could be hit a long distance that stung when you tried, you know, if you didn't catch it the right way. There were a whole bunch of features of it that once you move from the softball of the soaking age to the hardball of the, for want of a better term, the knickerbocker age, the whole nature of the game changes. And the, the, the best way I think about baseball in this period is kind of the difference between how you played sandlot baseball or any sandlot game where you got together with friends and just made up, you know, you had to have agreed upon rules, obviously, and a way of playing, but you also had to have ways of solving your problems if a dispute arose, um, as opposed to organized kids' games, mm -hmm. where now there's grown-ups who are running the show, there are specific rules, there are ways of settling disputes, etc. And it just psychologically just changes the whole character of the sport. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's an aspirational element to all of these words. There's a commonality to them that is aspirational whether it's manly, gentlemanly, scientific. And if you're looking at organizations or associations of men who were firefighters or workers or whatever they were, to, to me, a, a lot of what's going on here is baseball as a, an effort to recast yourself in an aspirational sense mm -hmm. by playing this game well. Yeah, yeah. 
And after the Civil War, Peter gets into that because a lot of the people were just at a loss because they felt that the younger generation was taking over and they didn't know what to do, which brought about the whole muffin games, which is how he closed his book. They wanted to keep they wanted to keep playing, but they weren't good enough for the new teams. Real quick, uh, just a quick before we move on to the segue, the gentleman, <clears throat> every book we read or go through and every newspaper article we look at, they always point out. You have the gentlemen and then you have the ladies and every aspect of it. They always talk about were there ladies present? How many ladies were they there? The ladies brought out the gentlemanly play and they gave three cheers for this and three cheers for that. So I think it's really interesting. And I, in a way, maybe it's a chicken or the egg, you know, are the players playing gentlemanly because there are ladies there are the ladies coming out because the players are by definition, gentlemen, um, and I don't know, I, I, I find that whole aspect really super interesting. And I, I know I've mentioned this other times, but we had mm-hmm. the presentation two years ago in Cooperstown about muscular Christianity and that movement. <clears throat> you have that whole like wholesome, you have the Whitman quote about, you know, we brought good lungs into our airs and went out, you know, went out and I, you know, we just uh, you know it was it was this whole like fitness aspect gentlemanly fitness ladies are there it was just this kind of all wrapped together for me Mm -hmm. yeah well you know uh, the first three parents the first three chapters of peter's book uh really center around the knickerbockers yeah uh it talks about the knickerbockers in the uh you know what, what baseball was like before the knickerbockers Mm-hmm. town ball and so forth right and a uh, little bit of cricket being played of course uh quite a bit of cricket in the new york city and philadelphia um then he talks about a little bit about the uh about the knicks knickerbockers uh about their game about who they are mm-hmm. and they are not just working class guys i mean they are for the most part people that are involved in some kind of merchandising or have some kind mm-hmm. of a profession where they have some free time and, and can make mm-hmm. some free time for themselves uh, to play their, their style of the game. And, and they create these rules for their club. Uh, when I look at this book, and I read it the second time, uh, I was thinking about Peter Morris, and he's really... <laughs> If you know Peter, he, he, he's very unassuming, but he is very, very, uh, somewhat a genius. Uh, he's a world scrabble champion. I was just going to say that, yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. And what's kind of interesting is every there's one history there. It's written as one history. I mean, when we read about the, regardless of who the author is, it's basically the same. Uh, you know, and there's some, you know, occasional things. But what's kind of interesting is when you have a guy like Peter Morris reading it, he's making observations and sometimes em- emphasizing points that, uh, for the most part is going over most of our heads. <laughs> you know, yeah. We're just, uh-huh. taking, we're just mm-hmm. taking it at face value. But when he talks about uh, things like, uh, you know, carrying on the traditions of the game, or what were the, what were the fields like? You know, how do we, uh, finally derive bases, you know, uh, from, uh, posts in the ground and, and so forth and so on. And he, he starts to put all of this, uh, as I read it, he kind of starts putting this all into a, se- a, a sequence, mm-hmm. you know, uh, time is traveling on and he's keeping right up with it. And I, that's what I found so enjoyable about the book was his um, ability to kind of uh, introduce new aspects of the game, like the socializing that you mentioned and, and other things, other rituals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. yeah you, you mentioned the, 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 the ballparks and the fields. And uh, I remember Peter mentioned that the, uh, uh, sometimes the ground was rocky. That wasn't at all flat, and there were trees in the way. And of course, there was not. Then he goes on to talk about how there was not much available land in the middle of the cities and outside the city limits. There were transportation problems. And I'm reminded about my work with the Chicago White Stockings in 1884. The city of Chicago was in possession of the lakefront where the Chicago's had their park. 
but the federal government owned the land. And, and in 1884, May of 1884, the government sued Chicago and the White Stockings because they said the city did not have the authority to allow any party to use public land for private or commercial purposes. And that's when Spalding had to go in to the west side. But does and you uh, does anyone know of any problems that other clubs face with finding ballparks? I know this was a big deal, Peter says, finding the place for a ballpark. But does anyone know of any specific examples, like especially before the Civil War? I know the the uh, the Knickerbockers, of course, went to Elysian Fields. But uh, are there any other examples anyone know of? Because I know I don't. Anyone? Okay. Anyway, Peter writes that the baseball was able to spread across the country from uh, New York as the rules were printed at let's see, Porter Spirit of the Times and also the, the New York Clipper in December of 1856. And of course, the United States was making a, a, a transition from oral communication to print. And the country was becoming a nation of mobility, he wrote, because we had the canals and we had railroads. And, and also... There were the printed rules, but Peter said there was usually one or two people in the town who had played baseball or at least seen baseball, the new types of baseball, and could be an instructor toward the other people. He said, like, the rules were fine, but it was also good to have someone who really knew what they were doing. And uh, so Peter talks about the Massachusetts rules and the Knickerbocker rules. And two of the main features of the Massachusetts rules were that the players could put a rudder out by hitting them with the ball, you know, called soaking. Uh, and this obviously could hurt until a lighter ball was introduced. And also there was, and this kind of took me a while to get my head around, there was no foul territory, so runners were not required to stay within the bases. And, and Peter mentions at least twice that the batters could hit the ball, you know, over the catcher's head because the whole area was uh, was fair fair game, so to speak. And, of course, the Massachusetts rules gave way to the, the Knickerbocker rules, but were, were there any reasons why the Nick? I, I figured one one reason they were popular, the Knickerbocker rules, because they had foul lines, and in a in a, in a in a small area, you needed you needed a small a small field. But were there any other reasons why the Massachusetts rules kind of went by the wayside in favor of the Knickerbocker rules? Anybody have anything? Well, one thing he points out is that. Uh, even though those rugged 19th century players and, you know, guys playing the game didn't want to be hit by the ball that hurt. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And the Knickerbockers had forbade that. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, it was all part of the Massachusetts game for quite a while um, uh, until they adopted the uh, the New York rules themselves. Um, so I think that's the additional factor right. of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, being, being so... <laughs> Plus, Peter gets into this several times throughout the book. He kept on talking about how the, the baseball was frowned upon by some of the genteel people because it was childish. And with the Massachusetts rules, there involved a lot of running, which seemed childish to a lot of people. But with the Knickerbocker rules, there was left his emphasis on running because there was uh, and and it seemed a bit more manly. We talked about Bill. We talked about manly there, and uh, and players like to hit the ball hard and far, and running seemed to be associated with kids. But you know, hitting the ball and hitting it hard seemed to be associated more with adults, and again, seemed more manly and 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 more men like. And and that's another reason why the Knickerbockers, I guess, rules took over because of this whole childish angle versus the manly angle. Well, oh, I, I, I think about. I think the. I, obviously, the ball in the soaking game did not weigh as much, was not as heavy, did not, you know, sting when it was thrown at you. It was like almost like a Nerf ball. Oh, and really? yeah. in many ways, that would have constrained the field of play. It would have made it basically a game played within the confines of the bases. I mean, you wouldn't be able to hit it farther. And and yeah. so the profound I, I've always thought that the profound thing about eliminating soaking uh -huh. was that in fact it allowed for a much harder ball and if oh, and if yeah. you look at the weight of the massachusetts ball and its regulations versus the new york game i believe and i i, I may be wrong in this that the new york ball was about three times as heavy as mm -hmm. the ball used in the massachusetts game and for mm -hmm. very good reason mm -hmm. you, because it, it's it hurt if you, it yeah. would hurt if you threw the, the hard ball at somebody so you didn't mm -hmm. throw it at 
you know, yeah. you had to change the rules of the game. The other factor I would say in terms of the 360 degrees that was associated with the soaking game where you could hit the ball, it, it wasn't a great game. And if you've ever been to a cricket match, you'll, you'll have this experience. I've been to a cricket match a couple of times at Lord's Cricket Ground. And what struck me more than anything else was how far away from the action you are, that the wickets are placed in the center of the field for obvious reasons, because the ball can be hit within a 360 degree boundary. Whereas with baseball, it's a 90 degree boundary. So you can have seating and 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 spectators right up close to the yeah. action. And mm -hmm. I think that must've been a profound you know, impact upon why spectators would find baseball a far more fascinating wow. game to get up close to than cricket where you're cricket, yeah even if you have the best seats you're a long way from the action between yeah. the wickets seems to me i always thought that factors that, that logically come into play one is simply down, uh, population new york's bigger than boston even in those days and it had more baseball teams more guys playing uh um, sure did uh so i would think that would just give momentum more momentum to the new york game compared to the Massachusetts game. I always saw it with me uh, when I look at the rules of the New York game versus the Massachusetts game. To me, for lack of a better re a better statement, I always thought the New York game was much cleaner. It's just a clean, it just seems more organized, if you will. You've got, you know, instead of one out, all out, you know, instead of the soaking, you've got, okay, we've got three up, three outs, you know, we bat until there are three outs. We have, you know, restriction. We don't have restrictions on runs. We don't have to do this rule. You know, instead of actually throwing it at the runner, we're throwing it at the base. It's just these simpler, more clean rules, if you will. And then I think the interesting thing, we when we read the, the other Peter Morris book about the Murphy Brothers groundskeepers, huge thing he talked about in there was about the, the, the suitable ground, the lack of suitable ground, yep. and how hard it was to find in those early years. And if they did find suitable ground, well, two years later, oh, sorry, this is going to be sold for a a market or housing or whatever it might be. So you had to condense the game down into those New York rules, which were much shorter to maybe go along with the lack of, like you said, the, the inability to find these great places to play. You know, you had the Elysian fields and what else? Everything moved to Elysian fields because everything was being condensed more and more in the city and what have you. So I, I don't know. To me, it's, it's clean. It's a clean game. And I think that's why Peter said that cricket, well, he mentioned a couple of reasons why cricket didn't take off. And one of the reasons was because you really needed a, an immaculate field, a really flat, and there just weren't that many places that were really flat, he says. You know, they were rocky at tree stumps and everything else. And as uh, someone said, the, you know, there were a lot of running in a wide field. The spectators couldn't even get close and everything else. Uh, and speaking of spectators, uh, again, more of the whole gentlemanly aspect. Peter mentions that uh, the spectators were were expected to applaud good play on both sides. Even if you had a favorite team, you applauded people on both sides. Uh, and players were expected to be honest about catching a fly ball or were, or were tagged out. Uh, umpires were treated with great respect by the players. And umpires' role was to ensure compliance with the spirit of the rules and really not the letter of the rules and to ensure that players acted in a in a gentlemanly fashion in fact there was the example peter said of a of a player who caught a a ball in the pocket of his sack coat and uh, the player said that the rules didn't say that you couldn't that you had to use your hands you couldn't use your coat to catch the ball so he expected the the umpire to uh to uh to rule on that uh uh but then he caused Competition started creeping in, and there started being less of a gentlemanly game. The umpires were given the authority to call. And I guess, and I think Peter mentioned that the whole balls of the strikes is when things all went to hell, so to speak. In 1858, umpires were given the authority to call uh, strikes on a batter who didn't strike at good pitches. Uh, in 1864, the concept of, of call balls were introduced to complement the called strikes. And Peter wrote that almost annually, the rules makers tweak the number of balls and strikes or they placed restrictions on all these decisions and uh and all this tinkering of the rules he says set the message that the, it was now the letter of the rules were more important than 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 the spirit and in fact the balls and strikes stop help stop the baseball from being uh 
a, a gentleman's game. And also, and before before this, the player's honor was at stake because that was all that was needed to prevent him from falsely claiming to have tagged somebody out or caught a ball on the first bounce from on the fly. And now the, the umpire was involved, which who was supposed to make all these subjective uh, decisions. Um, and Peter writes that some clubs ignored rules that they didn't like. And maybe we got into this already, but I don't know of any specific rules that were particularly ignored by clubs or, or Paul and your your vintage well I guess you mentioned too that you we all agreed beforehand you know what what was going to be done here what was going to be done there but I did not know of any other you know specific rules that were ignored by by clubs back then uh I mean there he talks about baseballs themselves uh I think it was like 10 ounces after a while the baseball was, I think he said. But he describes how baseballs were made either by players or by skilled craftsmen in the area. I think he even said that uh, if you didn't have a wall for the center, you could use the eye of a sturgeon, which sounds kind of gross to me. <laughs> you know? uh, and, and, and winners of the games would take home the game ball or a new one when a ball could be could be spared and uh and peter said that they'd write they had like a calligrapher to write the name of the name of the teams on there the date and the score and sometimes they'd be gilded uh and they and they present them with great loftiness to the to the winning to the winning team uh and i think john thorne may have mentioned this but uh uh there was a museum who had uh, one of these or maybe a couple of these balls on display from their local long ago club. But I would love to know if there were any other museums or place that would have some of these old time balls from the, from the forties or the fifties or the sixties. Um, and baseballs were used until they literally had the stuffing knocked out of them. Then a lively ball would become a dead ball. And, and of course uh, this would, this would affect skis. Uh, score and then we talked about the Knickerbockers preferring the hard lively ball and this went a long way to establish again establishing baseball as an adult practice you know it was no longer childish there was less emphasis on running you had a hard lively ball uh, you had a hard life baseball with no protective equipment brought on injuries which were at first badges of honor I guess Peter says uh, it also brought about broken windows and injuries to passersby which again then brought more and more emphasis to the fields outside of town than from playing in the in the in the city uh uh the city centers and 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 the new yorkers went to the uh, Legion fields um i mentioned the baseballs but peter spends a lot of time talking about the bats too and the bat batters made and use their own bats that could be five feet long and as, as he says as quote as thick as logs uh, the rules gradually adopted to restrict length and thickness. And and uh, I don't know much about bats. I remember in our last session, Joanne was talking about a bat that she had a duplicate, a bat made to resemble a, a certain type of bat. And I vaguely recall reading the bats were uh, pat, like paddles at one time. Uh, did anybody have any comments on the bats that were used back then or like Paul in your vintage game? Are there, are there specific bats that you use? Anybody? I'm sorry, I was eating dinner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, we, we play by, I can't remember the 64 rules, obviously, but there's only within, it has to be this long and this one, and that's it. There's just very, very yeah. minor things. You've got the different styles of them, but yeah, it's, it seemed like you could pretty much walk up there with a war club or walk up with a we a wagon wheel spoke. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> We've done some of the, you know, to show what you could use. I've seen buddies of mine walk up with a wagon wheel spoke just because so, yeah. Uh -huh. but yeah, I, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, don't don't some of this the bat differential come from come from England because they use different ways to play rounders and what they call baseball and various things because some of them were paddle games some of them we've seen lots of pictures of the old Judge series where the bat looks like it's twice as long That's as right. any bat. I forgot uh, about that. Uh, yeah. Today, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it doesn't seem uncommon. And certainly when people talk about bats, they talk about them as being much heavier than we use today. Yeah, because yeah. now we understand bat speed is more important than the 
heft of the the wood that that's hitting it. Uh, yeah. But the the idea of the, the the wagon tongue and those sort of things were certainly within the uh, news reports of games where they would talk of substantial bats that we don't talk about today. We talk about how they how thin the handle may be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, one thing to try to keep in mind, I think, when I was reading this, uh, was that <clears throat> Peter wrote this book in 2008, uh, you know, right, uh, up to 2008. It was published in 2008, so much of his research is uh, prior to 2008. And he does make the beginning of the book particularly very Knickerbocker-centric. Uh, uh, you know, he, he discusses at length the role of the Knickerbockers. And, you know, I recalling, you know, that when you think about Doc Adams and his role in the Knickerbockers and being vice president of the Knickerbockers and joining the Knickerbockers around 1843 or so, oh, 1840, about 1845, I think he's the vice president. By 1857, 58, he is codifying the rules, the first rules of baseball. So this accumulative effect of the Knickerbockers kind of, you know, coming up with some of the rudimentary things and then slowly but surely a couple of playing activities, you know, demanded that other rules be clarified and so forth. And by the time Doc Adams in 1858, 1857 writes the rules of baseball, he's incorporating all these things. Uh, what's going to be very interesting to me is that at the Fred this year, our panel discussion is titled How Important Were the Knickerbockers? Mm-hmm. Now, what's kind of interesting is this is a panel discussion that's going to be taking place probably about 20 years after Peter Morris began his research for this book. And it's going to be interesting because the, the, the three panelists, they're called the Bill Rizak, will moderate the panel, but the three panelists are Tom Gilbert, uh, Bob Folks and uh, uh, Bruce Alderess. And they all are very, very focused uh, on the early game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how did the early game evolve? So it'll be interesting to see what their take is. Were the Knickerbockers as important uh, as we think they were? <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's going to be an interesting discussion. Yeah. Well, and and to that point, Peter, um, Peter Morris makes the point that having instituted or or written out these rules in the mid 1840s, they did not proselytize. They did not try to, you know, seemingly they they didn't engage in games with other game uh, teams where they, you know, they they played largely within themselves. And you know, yeah, it, it's almost a ten year period before baseball really takes off. And so it, it really kind of begs the question, you know, what was going on in those 10 years that caused it to suddenly explode, you know, in, in the mid 1850s and not in the 1840s when they developed those rules? I, In my mind, that's one of the great conundrums of, of trying to, you know, come up with, with a, kind of an explanation of why baseball took off, you know, so many years after they brought in those rules. I don't have an answer. Yeah. Just around the time that those rules were being written in 1858, and as Bill, as you point out about that 10 year or so, or more, more years than, uh, almost more years than 10 years, of the Knickerbockers almost playing among themselves and, and not really, uh, you That's know, right. purposely advancing the game uh, to other clubs. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what the perspective is of some of those other folks who are really, uh, you know, a kind of extra panel in a sense for this particular period of time. Um, So I I, I think it's going to be pretty fascinating discussion. What what gets me in in Peter's book is that all these little minor things, just minor things would help change the whole course of baseball. He talks about the bases, like bases were tree stumps. So of course the, the distance between bases was not, was not uniform. Then they went on to stakes, but players could hurt themselves. And then they used flat stones 
and that did not stop the injuries. And then they used canvas bags, but people got tired of, of, of carrying them. And of course, there was still a problem of the umpires couldn't um, see the bases, so it was hard to see whether a player was out or safe. So then honesty started going out the window and the whole gentlemanly aspect, and, uh, uh, and players accepted uh, the umpire's ruling even when they knew he were, they were wrong, like no more of saying, no, 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 I was out. You know, they say, hey, if the umpire calls me safe, I'm going to be safe then. And as Peter wrote, quote, seemingly minor alterations to the game when accompanied by changes in the spirit in which the game was played were a major threat to the increasingly delicate fabric of baseball's pioneer era. So it all just kind of starts all cascading uh, forth like this. And of course, with the, now we talk about the lively ball, the ball clubs were crowded, eventually now crowded out of the city's parks. Uh, uh, one one park person said, don't damage the trees. Well, the trees were damaged. Uh, there was hard for the grass to grow. Uh, uh, then ball clubs were, were not really good neighbors, I guess, Peter said. There were trespassing complaints. There were the cutting offenses. There were also obscenities with the ball players, maybe with the spectators too, I don't know. Uh, the tendency for baseballs to to break things. Clubs had to play on lots and fields that nobody wanted. In the process, the game was modified too. Uh, drainage problems. A lot of the fields were anything but flat, or even if a flat, uh, the field was flat, there was uh, next to a stream in which balls would land and get lost, kind of like what Paul was saying when they talked about before his, they'd get together and, and talk about the conditions before the game. The fields would have high grass, they have dried vegetation, the club sounded hard to deal with rain. And as Peter wrote, quote, all of these deterrents could have a dramatic effect on how baseball was played. Though infielders would check problem areas of the field before the games, they positioned themselves uh, accordingly. If the base were in the middle of the puddle, they'd move the base. Uh, then clubs, he said, moved to kind of gradually move to dead baseballs because in, of, re, of, quote, of quote unquote real estate. You know, the the fields were not big enough for the lively balls and the, and the lost balls, and uh, uh, and that all of these things meant that the game would be played differently from from town to town. Um, I like what Peter said about the folksy or the backwards conduct that often attracted attention. Like some of these people would would play up this aw shucks, Andy Griffith type atmosphere because it would kind of disarm the team coming to town. Uh, and in my own my own uh, my white stocking research, I learned about the Pecatonica Illinois Club, which entered a major tournament and they lost the game 49 to one, but they did win a silver trophy on which was inscribed the, the word practice. Because Peter mentions that there was always a pra the, the hope of practice, the practice of hope, I think he said, where the, the clubs believed that all you had to do was keep practicing and you'd achieve success. Uh, and I mentioned before about the clubs having the common traits. You know, they had the silk stocking trade. They were the Irish run from the west side. And they had a lot of clubs were organized by occupation. And I... And I know I started going through some of the names, the unique names. Uh, uh, St. Louis had the unions and the empires. I don't know what that really particularly means, uh, unions or empires. New Orleans had the Atlantics, the Barbary Lees, the Southerns. Baltimore had the, had the pastimes. I'm not sure if they had any particular meaning or not. I don't know if anybody, anybody would know, though. I always read and that after, that... The Civil War was important because the soldiers went home and they brought the, the baseball with them. And, and and Peter says that that is true, but there are more accounts about how clubs disbanded after the Civil War. And I did not know that at all. Uh, some of the leaders of baseball clubs came back, but they had other responsibilities too. And other people took their places. But the old leadership was gone. Honesty was going out the window. And allegiance to one's club. And Peter talked a lot about the whole civic pride, the whole allegiance to your club was was governed by a whole mercenary uh, approach now too. Uh, uh, younger people were taking over the game. There was a vicious cycle with umpires. They made more rulings. The umpires did. So players t started to not being responsible about uh, uh, about being honest and upholding the interests of fair of, of fair play. Uh, and then of course, I'm looking at the time here. Uh, money. 
I love to talk about money because money is at the root of everything, I guess. The non-playing members of clubs uh, help financially support the teams, started to resent being financially supportive of the teams. The, the star players started going for greener pastures. Uh, the clubs turned to admission fees, which made sense, but it's hard to enforce admission fees when you're playing on an open lot. So then they started building these enclosed clubs to build when you built the enclosed clubs, you need enclosed fields, you needed money to support these things. Uh, and then the players realized that the owners were making a profit, so they started wanting money too. It was all just built upon itself here. They wanted their own share of the money, and there was a lot of pushback about this. The veteran players resented it because they had paid their own expenses before. Uh, then there were the non-playing members who felt that their money was going toward the greedy owners. Uh, but Peter says there was a lot more than, than just this. The clubs collected admission fees, but they were also assuming their share of the, uh, of the expenses. So it was hard to determine what was income and what was just being reimbursed uh, for expenses. And then, of course, you get into the amateurs versus professionals and how the players got cushy jobs, sometimes in government. I like what he said about the Treasury Department and the Nationals in Washington. The Treasury Department was putting, putting, uh, providing all these bill, all these jobs for player for players. Um, hey, Jack, I'd like to go back to the Civil War argument for yeah, a second. Yeah, uh -huh, sure thing. So, so I read this too. I think we've all probably seen this as somehow the Civil War was responsible for spreading the New York game around. But 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 Peter Morris argues that in fact the the spread had begun before the Civil War, and it was really due to college students, you know, leaving the New York area and going to colleges. And I found that a very odd argument. First of all, an infinitesimally small number of people went to college in the yeah. 1830s and 40s. It's less than five percent. And second of all, people usually went to college in their hometown it would be unusual for a new york student to go out to st louis or chicago or somewhere like that um to to go to college and i just i mean i didn't get into the footnotes there he has a lot of footnotes in the back which he doesn't yeah. bother you know putting into the text so you never know when he's got a footnote or not but i wondered if anybody else had a had a position on that had a thought about that yeah i had the same reaction and another point yeah. is back then very few colleges had athletic programs. It was very unusual. And if there was ath athletics at the college, typically it was student run. Yeah. And so, yeah, it seemed implausible to me. Yeah, I didn't catch that at all. So thanks you guys for mentioning that, you know. There also wasn't as many colleges. I mean, you know, we consider this college practically on every corner. <laughs> so, you know, back then there were few and far between. That's well, right, and, but that's and some, and some of the colleges were particularly influenced. So, for example, uh, Princeton, uh, you know, located in you know in New Jersey, uh, you know, uh, an hour or so, or, or probably more than you know, <laughs> two hours from New York City. But Princeton was greatly influenced in its early baseball by Brooklyn-born students. So you had these kids coming out of Brooklyn who were playing baseball and eventually making their way to Princeton and they continued playing baseball. So, but I agree uh, with the idea that it's probably overbaked when they talk about uh, the role of college students particularly. I think uh, a lot of towns just had town ball teams that became baseball teams and they eventually, uh, you know, adopted the New York game, and uh, it became a style of play. Thanks. I like to read. I think Peter Morris was smart enough to quote Bill Rizak, <laughs> and Bill Rizak makes a statement in the chapter. It's a one sentence. It's the uh, chapter that is. Uh, it talks about competitiveness and professionalism. And he talks about this pivotal year that he defines as 1867. And this is Bill Rizak speaking, but Peter quoting him. Uh, as the historian William Rizak observed, by 1868, no one was having, <clears throat> was bearing any defeats gracefully. 
You know, and I was I going to ask that. that. Kind of a profound observation. Yeah. yeah, because he kept stressing 1868. I have that in my notes here. That was a pivotal year, and I don't really know why. I never. Well, I know that's when the era of professionalism started. You know, with uh, <laughs> the with the uh, National Association of Baseball Players. But was there any other reason besides you no? Know, well, I think it's Peter Morris's march. Yeah. Uh, toward you know, the vanishing of, but didn't we have fun? fun. Right, uh-huh. So it was a game that was not so much fun Yeah. until it, until a certain aspect of it resurfaced again. Yeah, yeah. My take. <laughs> yeah. As Peter wrote in one time, I'm looking at the clock here, you guys, it says, uh, quote, ball players began to revolve from, uh, they talk about revolvers uh, naturally, and uh, more and more people demanded money and larger gate receipts. Club allegiance suffered, and as Peter wrote, ball players began to revolve from club to club without regard to feelings of kinship and loyalty. Uh, and the ball field in New Park had created great expectations. And when the club lost, they were heavily criticized. There was no longer civic pride. There used to be civic pride, in which you know we'll get them next time, so to speak. But now it's a, just just a long. Just, just a lot of criticism, I guess, and uh, uh, so. It's, and then, after the Civil War, some of the ball players—I mentioned this before—they could not play on their own team. They kind of got tired of how the how the game has changed. And then they come back full circle and start those muffin games, uh, muffin teams, which I had never heard of before, too. All they wanted to do was play and have fun. They almost took pride in their muffinness, so to speak. Uh, Peter talks about that, and as Peter wrote. Quote, more than anything else, Muffin Games served as timely reminders that as long as winning was not made the be-all and end-all, a great time could still be had playing baseball. Okay. And that kind of wraps up the whole book. Peter, why don't you... Uh, right on time, too. <laughs> you don't, you don't, it was a nice, very nice session. Peter, do you want to... you have some things to say to close? Unmute yourself. You're muted, Peter. We can't hear you. Can't hear you, Peter. Hmm. There you keep, go. I keep yeah. doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I see we have Bill Felder here for a moment. I just want to point him out for a second because he is the editor of one of our uh, committee productions, which was uh, Inventing Baseball, the 100 Greatest Games in the 19th Century. And uh, Bill, thank you again <laughs> for your, that marvelous job you did. I want to... Uh, all, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. Now that it's over, it's fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, it was a great book. The, I want to just say that um, uh, our next uh, scheduled uh, book club discussion will be with uh, Matt Albertson, uh, and it's this book, uh, Outside the Lines, uh, uh, and it's a Gilded Age baseball. This is actually one of the four series of this book, and this one is going to uh, concentrate a little bit on uh, alcohol, fitness, and cheating in 1880 baseball. So uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, and uh, Matt will do that at the very end of March. I think it's March 26th. And Correct. that'll be our last of the third, or our third of the winter series. Secondly, uh, we're going to be working on um, getting uh, our spring and and or summer sessions together. Um, we don't know. We, we managed to pull off um, a book a month, practically. It's a little more than a book a month, actually. Uh, coming up on our first year will be coming in, in, in the summer. So uh, we are through uh, about three quarters of our year now. So uh, we should be good. Uh, April, May, and June being the last of the four quarters. Uh, I also would like to invite any of you who have, uh, uh, and I know there's some great talent out there, uh, any of you to moderate a discussion. 
please just email me and uh, you know say you may be interested in moderating and uh, what book you have in mind. So um, you know I'm here. I don't know. I'll probably release another uh, call for uh, for moderators. Um, <clears throat> that's basically it, Jack. Did another superb job. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's a very uh, it's a Thank very you. uh it's a very insightful book. Mm -hmm. uh, I gained some things from that book I didn't realize that had really affected my way of thinking. I was on that panel last year at the, at the Fred that discussed uh, color lines in 19th century baseball, and I always had the notion, and I never really understood <laughs> until I reread it. Uh, where Peter Morris gets into that chapter about traditions and, uh, uh, you know, practices of clubs, you know, what their traditions were, yeah. the tradition of having the banquets and so forth. One of the traditions, of course, were all of these games that involved fat and skinny players or yes. players that were had arm amputees or, or leg amputees, or, you know, and it went on and on and all the bachelors and married men, you know, when they did all of these things. But one line they never crossed with the color line. That's right. Just and it was that. an interesting point. And I was somewhere it was buried in the back of my head. And it was a point that I tried to make on that panel uh, about the uh, failure of uh, integration in 19th century baseball. Uh, was that it, it grew really very deep and, and went very far back. You know, and Peter makes that point. Yep, he did. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like... Uh, have an Einstein in the committee <laughs> mm -hmm. and your committee happens to be on physics. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And that's what kind of Peter Morris brings to the table. You know, he kind of he makes these observations and so forth and I thought they're very interesting. Well again, Jack, thank you very much. Thank uh, you everybody. I appreciate your attention and your comments too. Uh, I love having a real discussion like this. Yeah, it's a great discussion. You know, he offers so much here. Mm -hmm. Bob? That's Bob. all. Everyone have yeah. a good night. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. Again. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Uh -huh. See you soon.